not rushing into meditation, giving ourselves time to settle in, feel comfortable. Feel free to grab a cushion. So in fully arriving here, We're not expecting the mind and body to be different than how they are. There's a sense of understanding that the heart and mind and body are just naturally expressing whatever conditions are present given everything that's come before, the effort it takes to show up, to get ourselves here, activities during the day and the week and stretching back. So we don't have to have uh, any judgment about how the mind and body and heart are showing up. There's this understanding. We could call that a generous understanding, just like we might give someone else the benefit of the doubt if they're being a little impatient or seem distracted. Of course, sometimes people are having a bad day, of course. However it is for us, maybe it's peaceful, happy to be here. Maybe there's some agitation left over from the day. But we can have this generous relationship giving ourselves to the moment fully, not waiting for it to be perfect, but this moment with this mind and heart and body. How do we show up fully, wholeheartedly? Just to meet the moment as it is. We can give ourselves the gift of relaxation, encouraging what tension in the body and in the heart can be released. Just a gentle encouragement that it's okay. It's okay to land here, to let go of what can be let go of, and to cultivate a full presence as if this moment were really precious, important. Just like we would show up for a good friend in a 
full way, putting aside for some time our preoccupations and concerns just to be there. And we might sense a subtle pleasure, happiness that comes from this generosity of just showing up. Freely giving our attention to our own direct experience. And just as we show up in a generous way, we can also receive in a generous way, receiving the breathing that happens on its own, receiving whatever energy the body has Receiving the different sensations and sounds that touch our awareness. So in this way, there is a simple relationship. And we're practicing, sensing how it can be a joyful relationship of showing up, of receiving of meeting And maybe sometimes we emphasize the giving, showing up, being present, giving our attention. And maybe sometimes we emphasize the receiving, receiving what's already here, receiving awareness that's already present. So we'll continue in silence, cultivating this relationship, meeting the moment, receiving what's here to be known.
So in mindfulness practice, there is an effort required to remember, to recognize the present moment's experience. But we can notice the flavor of that effort What would it be like to receive awareness when it arises and when we remember to be aware, sensing that as a gift, a gift we both receive and a gift that we offer to ourselves, the gift of remembering, the gift of presence, the gift of forgiving ourselves for being lost in thought. So in this way, the whole process of being aware can have this flavor of generosity, of freely giving and receiving and the joy of receiving life, the moment, and giving in a way the one thing we have to give, which is our our intention to be awake, So sensing this relationship of receiving, offering, can be a way of softening, softening the effort. So effort feels less effortful when it's a gift coming from the heart, not just uh, something that we have to do. When we give freely, it's something that we get to do. We get to show up, we get to apply ourselves as best we can. And we get to receive the natural results of that. So we'll continue for just a few more minutes. Perhaps for the last few minutes, emphasizing the receptive quality
And for the last minute, maybe practicing with the eyes open if they've been closed. And letting go of directing the mind towards any particular experience. Receiving awareness that's already present, happening on its own. We'll take a minute or two if people want to stretch. Feel free to stand if you'd like. So thanks for being here, everyone, both online and in person. It's nice to have a mix of our friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the second meeting um, of this twice monthly group that I started on, on the Paramis for now. And the Paramis are this list of 10 virtues um, that are really supportive in, in our daily life and in meeting life as it is. Um, one teacher, Joseph Goldstein, uh, who's um, kind of a grandfather figure of our insight meditation tradition, in one of his books calls Parami grace along the way. Um, yeah, in order to to show up to life as it is, which is what we're doing in our mindfulness practice, these qualities will get developed um, just through our mindfulness practice because it takes patience. You know, anyone who's been on a meditation retreat or even sat, you know, meditated for half an hour, you know, it takes patience just, you know, to bear with, to kind of go against the stream of our mind's conditioning, which is um, a lot of it's distraction and, and just getting caught up in one thing or another. So that, that persistence, so that's one of the parami and maybe I can remember them all. So there's generosity, there's morality or ethical sensitivity, there's renunciation, there's energy, there's wisdom, there's patience, there's resolution, there's truthfulness, there's uh, goodwill and equanimity, and maybe all of them. 
So this is a great list. You know, there's so many lists in Buddhism, and this is one we can memorize. And we're really encouraged to, um, you know, you don't have to be able to name them all, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> and uh, um, because that's kind of the first level that I, I talked about last last time, and Ajahn Suchitto, uh, whose book I'm using as sort of a reference, um, which you can get online. Uh, he talks about three stages with the parami. Uh, one is initiating, so just on an intellectual level, having that information available. So just to have that list, I mean, maybe you noticed, at least for me, when I bring them to mind, um, even just like I just did in a in a cursory way, you know, there's something that, that can sort of recognize, oh yeah, that's a possibility, that's a potential for this heart. And, they, you know, these 10 have all these different flavors, but they're all kind of reminding us of our heart's potential to rise and kind of have a perspective on, um, on challenges in life, on, yeah, just the, the ordinary um, ups and downs of life and, yeah, ways of meeting that, that... Um, yeah, sort of the heart rises out of its kind of self, just uh, overly self-concerned or caught up in the floods, which is kind of the frame that Ajahn Suchitto gives in his first chapter, which we talked about last time. But yeah, just these natural ways the mind get, gets flooded. So there's kind of two ways of translating the, the word um, asava, because it's ambiguous apparently, so you can, the mind can get flooded, you know, flooded by its desires and its fears, and the mind also can flood out, you know, so we're kind of flooding out and it's just sort of caught up and lost in the external. And so the parami are sort of creating a vantage point um, where we can look at those floods and have some perspective on them. Um, you know, if we're just kind of caught up in, say, anger or fear, you know, we can really be, the mind can really justify those patterns in whatever way, and we all, all our minds are conditioned differently. But from the point of view of its own kind of perspective, you know, they can just kind of fuel themselves, these, um, yeah, patterns. And so, but what, you know, if you have, say you're angry at someone, which happens, and say we have this other just reference point of patience or goodwill, like what does goodwill look like, you know, in a situation where anger is totally justified, where, you know, if we talk to our friends, you know, they would, we, they could get on our side. And so this is, and I think this is important because we can take the paramis as just ideals and use them to just, um, yeah, have them be impossible ideals, unrealistic, or, um, yeah, they can just stay on that intellectual level and we can even use them, we can use the ideal of goodwill to feel bad about how we're not, you know, kind enough or something. Same with all of them. So this is why in, in this threefold um, progression that Ajahn Suchitto gives. So there's initiating, which is just understanding, you know, thinking about how does, th does this make sense? You know, is this something that inspires me on an intellectual level? And then the second one is gathering. So kind of applying that information in the moment and particularly when, uh, when it's not easy or when it, there's some resistance to that, um, and then the third, he says, is completion. So when it's natural, you know, when the heart has enough confidence, oh yeah, this is actually for my benefit, for others' benefit. Um, so yeah, I think with all the parami, to, to not, yeah, to not just jump to, yeah, it, you know, as an ideal, they can be inspiring. But what's really interesting is to explore kind of that middle ground of where you know, like today we'll talk about generosity. So, you know, generosity is an ideal. We, we hear it all the time because it's often used to solicit donations in all sorts of contexts. So we have this, you know, we can be kind of, 
yeah, they, it, there can be that flavor. Oh, I should be generous. We all know we should be generous. But that, you know, that usually, you know, it's, it's almost like you say the word generosity or, you know, any, yeah, in any context where there's this ask, right? And immediately we can get tight around that because we kind of know. We know that's, that's the drill and we're expected to give. And so... Yeah, so just to, to acknowledge that with all these parami, there is this kind of teasing out, you know, wisdom is one of the parami. I think that's the one I forgot. But wisdom, you know, so they're all interrelated and inform each other. So wisdom is what helps us discern, you know, what the Buddha said about giving is we should give where we feel inspired and where we think our gift will be well used. Um, so there's some wisdom there. There's some discernment it's not just um yeah it's not just giving for its for yeah for its um yeah without thinking about it so we'll talk about uh dana i sometimes prefer to use poly terms because yeah english terms we can already have different associations with them like i was saying with generosity so ajahn suchito translates it as generosity or just sharing which i like i like sharing you know there's it's very direct um and it's less yeah you know just like we're giving something but it's yeah there's a sense of relationship there uh, maybe a bit more on an equal level than just I give to you, but no, we we share. I'm, I'm sharing, um, and that's one way we can think about this whole realm of both giving and receiving is um, part of what yeah this just opening to this um, to this way of relating is opening to the fact that we do live in a shared reality you know we are in relationship so on a practical level dana ajahn suchito makes this point is a way of is a simple way of cultivating a wholesome relationship you know so many of our relationships are complicated in different ways even our you know our close relationships there's all sorts of yeah you know different ways that we relate to each other but in the you know in moments of dana uh it's a simple relationship you know that's a it's a simple intention um when the heart opens and you know it feels joy at wanting to offer something or when we're receiving something so and this is probably why this uh yeah just giving sharing you know sharing meals is just you know or whatever is just such kind of a a basic um, foundation basic element of so many traditions and just when we gather and i was kind of thinking of it too is just in a way it's how we maintain any any of our relationships um is just through kind of this this cycle of giving and receiving oh you know oh you, you know and again it, it's not just about giving things but you know giving our time giving our attention it's it's one of the ways that we show people we love them that we care about them so it's kind of like yeah a basic currency of relationship um but it's a currency that only works <laughs> when it's given freely you know so it's it's different than uh a transaction because uh yeah, there's no expectation. It's given, like the Buddha said, because we feel inspired and because we think it will be well used or we could frame that or, or think of that as it will be appreciated, you know. That was one thing I was reflecting on is where it's not just about giving because... Um, yeah, like, for example, you know, gift giving at Christmas, I don't know about everyone else, but 
I've definitely gotten gifts that I always appreciate, you know, any gift that anyone gives me, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just, it's a fact, I think, that a lot of gifts that people receive, you know, go into the trash <laughs> because, you know, maybe there wasn't that, that wisdom, that discernment of, you know, will this gift be well used or so this consideration of, um, yeah, really feeling inspired. I think just in my own experience, there's a difference, you know, other, t- you know, times where I have felt, oh, I just need to, you know, feeling a sense of obligation or something, I need to give someone something as opposed to, you know, I think there's a lot of creativity in generosity, um, you know, when we, it's that where we feel inspired and where we think it will be well used or well appreciated, you know, and again, it doesn't have to be a thing, but like, um, you know, a material thing, but just that thought, you know, if you, if this happens to you, I mean, I, I think part of this training is that we stay open to it. So like you get the thought, oh, like I could do this for that person and they would like it, you know? So that's, you know, the, the teachings say we, sh- um, you know, with generosity, we feel happiness before we give, you know, when we think of, oh yeah, you know, I have a book that my friend would really like, or, you know, my mom, uh, could use some help in this way or whatever. Um, so we, we feel happiness before we give, we feel happiness. It says like the mind feels clear when we're, when we're offering, probably because there's some, some wisdom there of like, yeah, this is good. <laughs> like, uh, this is appropriate. This is helpful. So we're really present there with the gift. And then afterwards we feel, we feel happy. We feel gratified. Yeah, that was, that was good. Um, So maybe I'll read Ajahn Suchitto. For each of the parami, he has a description of it. And I really like his descriptions. They're succinct, but also kind of bring out some of the the important elements of it. So he says, uh, recognizing the joy of sharing and acknowledging that we all come into the world subject to pain, sorrow, sickness, and death, I aspire to offer what I can in terms of resources, hospitality, healing, and wise advice. I like that he brings in just that shared reality of that we're all subject to, you know, to suffering. And in that context, then, I think, yeah, sharing and generosity, yeah, it becomes more sharing and, and um, yeah, it sort of puts us on an equal playing field that, yeah, we're, we're kind of all in the same boat. And if we could sort of not only help someone else potentially or give someone else something, but just that it's, it's a way, like I was saying, of it's a, maybe one of the most basic ways of creating a relationship, creating a connection. And that is a cause for joy. And it's sort of like, yeah, in this world where there's already, you know, it's already, it's just hard <laughs> to be a living, sensitive being. Why wouldn't we avail ourselves of that joy of sharing, you know, and connection? it makes things a little easier. I mean, what would, you know, I was saying this last time, I think, with with all the paramis, but like, in a way, the paramis are what, yeah, what makes this human life, you know, with its vulnerabilities, what makes it potentially beautiful, you know, which it's not avoiding the difficulties in life, but kind of using them in a way, as a way to develop, yeah, the heart's, Yeah, the heart's potential. Yeah, and I think I think all throughout this talking about this, we can't separate our understanding of this concept from just our own conditioning, particular individual, but also cultural. So. Um, 
I think it's fair to say we, we live in, in this society, in the dominant paradigm, freely giving and freely receiving is not always that easy to come by and sort of the main mode of relationship, you know, by and large, just in terms of making a living and, you know, yeah, in almost all contexts is transactional. Um, so that, you know, that has an effect, you know, that, that way of looking at things as opposed to, yeah, other contexts that we may be in touch with. I mean, and this is why contexts like Common Ground, as an example, but Common Ground is just following in the tradition of, you know, in the Buddhist tradition of, of things being offered freely and of this recognition and cultivation and appreciation of this uh, way of relating, of freely giving and receiving, that, that that has a very different flavor. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, especially in this context, you know, where everything has a price, you know, to come somewhere where everything is offered freely, no questions asked, it's kind of, it doesn't really make sense. And I think that's, that's um, it's, but it's, it feels really, yeah, it feels good that it doesn't make sense. And it's sort of, it's, subversive um, when everything, yeah, when we're sort of being conditioned to always be in that mode of how much can I get without, you know, giving or, you know, well, what's the price here? Because someone's always going to be trying to take advantage of me, right? <laughs> like, even if it says it's free, but there's fine print or something. So just that you know, that sense of being on alert, of not really, yeah, trusting, you know, and, you know, and it, it's just the way things are, so, you know, because of all sorts of causes and conditions, but this is just, the point is to appreciate how that, how it's not a blank slate, you know, our minds are conditioned in particular ways, and um, to appreciate that, so that we can be aware of that conditioning, and aware of how, yeah, it influences us and being willing to question those values and yeah, even in our own little ways, obviously we still live in this society and we have to, you know, be part of it. Um, but we can, yeah, appreciate when we have, when we do make contact with, um, you know, yeah, traditions and teachings that are pointing to another way of relating. Um, yeah, that we can cultivate that in our own way, even in the midst of whatever larger context is there. And that's, I think, where things, where it's interesting and it's, there's room for creativity and um, yeah, it's, it's uh, and it, you know, and I think it is a a political thing in a way, even just to have, yeah, just in our in our most you know intimate relationships, personal lives. It's sort of like, yeah, especially these days with uh, with social media sort of really capitalizing on our most basic you know desires for connection, to have spaces, even if it's just you know a friend, you know, a partner, family, but these places that are not completely taken over by, you know, maximizing, you know, any sort of outward facing kind of, yeah, transactional, measurable thing, product that we show that we're accumulating. But no, it's like, I, you know, I like you. And so, I give you my time, I give you my attention, I give you my love, and it's, I'm not expecting anything in return, and just how good that feels. So yeah, I think we, we cultivate that, you know, in our relationships, and, and we can find ways to cultivate that, um, even if it's just in our own heart, while we're still participating. Yeah, I buy, I've given you money for this, but I'm also seeing that as, as a generous thing, even if it's just in my own heart you know, because 
I could give my money somewhere else, but so we do, we can cultivate that sense of generosity and of giving and receiving. You know, ultimately, this is where we cultivate it first and foremost is in our own hearts, you know, and, and how do we sense that, that, and how do we sense receiving? I mean, we can appreciate that the money that gets taken out of our paychecks for taxes, you know, at least part of it seems to be being used in a way that is beneficial and, you know, people plow the roads. And so just this sense where we can sense it of being, yeah, being part of these cycles of giving and receiving. And yeah, when we can form, like I was saying, friendships and, you know, there's, a, there's so much room for, for you know, w within whatever bounds we have in our lives and, you know, the privileges and resources we have, but to kind of create these little pockets of dana is really, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And it gives us some sense of agency that we, we don't have to just, you know, charge everyone for everything. <laughs> and there's, uh, I think it was maybe a, I forget what book it was in, but there's sort of, there was some interesting research on certain things that people will just have a, a negative reaction to a disgust if they're, if they're monetized, you know, and like, yeah. So there are sort of these areas where we feel like, no, that's, that's kind of off limits. You know, like love, basically. Like, I wouldn't charge my friend, you know. Well, you, I'll give you 50 bucks if you come hang out with me. <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and it's, yeah, it's like, I mean, I think there's so much for us to look at here around our conditioning and when it comes to money. And, and it's, yeah, it's not to to have a fixed view on what it should look like or anything, but just, I think examples like common ground and, you know, just the Buddhist tradition. Um, yeah, they can just be, um, yeah, they, they just sort of stand in contrast to ways that maybe, yeah, where we have that conditioning and, you know, one story, for example, because um, Dharma teachers, some of the, a lot of the centers, insight centers um, in this early Buddhist tradition, a lot of the ways they figured out to kind of do it, to kind of try to make this thing work here in this context, where there isn't sort of centuries of uh, just that value being kind of embedded and just, you know, in Buddhist countries, there's just so much reverence and appreciation for the monastic tradition that there's a lot of support but but here it's kind of this hybrid so um so the way it's often works is the the centers will charge you know for room and board but they'll often have a sliding scale but but dharma teachers really for the most part in, in our insight tradition offer all their teachings freely and they don't they don't charge um you know by and large that's the case and so th these are modern examples in our, you know, in our, you know, in this most capitalist of countries, you know, of people, yeah, kind of because they're inspired and because they've received, you know, their teachings in that way, going all the way back to the Buddha, you know, kind of, yeah, living in that way. And, you know, and I don't know, I'm sure everyone has, you know, different situations and how exactly it works, but, but one story is, teachers of mine, you know, well-respected teachers in our tradition, Kamala Masters and Steve Armstrong. This was many years ago after one retreat I did with them and they were just talking about Donna, like, like there's often, you know, at the end of a retreat, it's time to reflect on, on that cycle. Um, and they said something about <laughs> just reflecting on how it's basically worked for them, you know, even though I'm you know, they live frugally or whatever, but it's basically worked for them for all those years. You know, and they're talking about, yeah, just kind of opening up a little bit more about, you know, what, what that's like. And, but one thing they said is like, yeah, and, and at one point when things, you know, when there wasn't a lot of money, we decided to give more of our money away. <laughs> and yeah, obviously like 
we need to be judicious and take care of ourselves and generosity doesn't exclude ourselves but for me it's just always an interesting reflection you know where does the sense of yeah having come from where does the sense of you know because if we um if we don't think we have anything to give we won't offer and, and there's sort of a a chicken and an egg thing i think with this where um in some ways it's it's reflecting on what we might have to offer you know whatever that might be that makes us feel like we have something to offer you know and feel then so in a way generosity helps us feel like we have more because we're taking the time to reflect to even ask that question it's you know so much of you know our actual experience in life is what we pay attention to and so if we're all you know like we're all really primed to do and everything is you know advertising and everything is always the message is always to think about what we don't have and how much more we could have and compare ourselves with others so that you know that has an effect whereas if you know we wake up in the morning and our basic orientation is you know how can i participate not just like how can i give everything i have away but like you know what you know how what is there that i can show up and offer to be in relationship because it feels good because that what else are we going to do with our lives <laughs> um other than yeah show up and obviously yeah through that you know we all need to make a living but you know that you know we can either look at that as oh this chore that somehow i need to you know find something to do that someone will give me money for to like well i mean yeah i want to be in relationship i i don't want to you know even if i had the choice i wouldn't want everyone else to have to pull all the work and i'll just you know so i guess i don't know who said this but i think it's a communist thing like from each according to their um does anyone know the quote from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs or something like that you know so that's sort of an ideal in terms of how societies could be run where no it's like people want to we want to be in relationship we want to show up we want to contribute maybe that's a natural inclination not that it's the only inclination i mean i i know i definitely have laziness in my heart but yeah you know but if but if it was you know but i wouldn't feel good if yeah if i wasn't doing anything and everyone else was taking care of me but i think we have so much cynicism because we know that things are unequal and aren't you know we're not living in a communal situation collectively so then we can sort of feel resentful and but in, you know and again i'm not saying we shouldn't strive for revolution but yeah on a on a personal level we can you know we can be looking at our hearts and what the effect of those ways of relating is you know how we internalize some of that even if you know we're we think we should all share everything but but we're also stingy because that's just how you know we've been conditioned and and it sort of makes sense especially you know it's sort of like again sort of chicken and the egg if if well i don't want to be the only one being generous cuz then i'll be taken advantage of so you know this is all something we need to explore for ourselves there's no one way but on the spiritual level on the internal level just getting to know those different movements of heart and and what they feel like is what will help us you know just at, at the end of the day it's about joy it's about happiness like are there more is there more joy available that than i might think just through that uh yeah kind of being open to opportunities where the heart wants to wants to show up and on the same side on on the receiving end too are there opportunities for for happiness and gratitude and contentment that maybe we're missing so here's uh, maybe some quotes kind of to back up some of the points i'm making 
and then I'll save some time to, to hear from everyone or whoever wants to, to share. Um, so this is from Ajahn Suchito. I'll send out this article. Um, he has an article on the graduated path, which is um, this point he makes in the book too, but basically that the Buddha didn't always start by teaching kind of the wisdom teachings and you know that suffering is the result of clinging. He would often teach about generosity and about ethical sensitivity and about renunciation and then sort of get to the wisdom teachings. So that's this article, The Graduated Path. But in this article he says, <clears throat> whether this is through offering things, service, voluntary work, teaching, or just attention, generosity makes us feel rich, creative, and an essential part of other people's lives. So it's really, yeah, this kind of shift, this turning, sort of feels paradoxical. This shift of orientation towards how much can I get to, yeah, it actually feels good to, to be part of something bigger than myself. <laughs> Here's another interesting, uh, this is from, uh, from the Buddha, from the suttas. Um, suttas are the, the early discourses in early Buddhism. So when the world is on fire with aging and death, one should salvage one's wealth by giving. What's given is well salvaged. What's given bears fruit as pleasure. What isn't given does not. Thieves take it away, or kings. It gets burnt by fire or lost. So again, it's this very interesting take on kind of investing what we have like I, what i take from that is sort of yeah you know what people say that phrase like you can't take it with you you know and that's i think can can relate to money but but also to you know to time and just again this is just this isn't something to believe but to check out for ourselves like um yeah, just that is the pleasure of of that establishing of a just a mo even just a moment of of happiness, you know, in in giving and that that relationship. Do we regret that? And I know I've given stuff away that I do regret, but I think it's because it was coming from a, you know, maybe yeah, there wasn't. You know, I didn't take the time to really sense, you know, where is this intention coming from? But yeah, just this idea of that the happiness of giving is maybe more than the happiness that we might get from having, holding on to my last cookie. I mean, for real, like, I've, I've had that exact experience where I, it's like, it's that middle stage, that gathering stage where it's like, there is some pain, like, I really don't want to give this away, but, you know, maybe the happiness of establishing that, that happy relationship and letting go of that tightness of clinging and just that, yeah, that somehow that just having that, whatever that is, you know, if it's a material thing, that it's actually a greater happiness. Ajahn Suchito in, in the last part of the chapter on, on generosity encourages us to give ourselves the gift of time where we're not doing anything. And he's, he's really great about this in general in his teaching. Um, I think he really gets this point about modern life where they're one of, you know, I think just one of our greatest sources of stress and suffering is sort of this, this pressure, this, um, you know, and I think it's related to what we're, what I've been talking about with kind of, yeah, competition, you know, scarcity. It's like, well, then if, if that's the world I live in, then I can't, you know, time is money. And so just always kind of 
optimizing and like, well, there's no, and then, I mean, but what kind of life is that where we don't, yeah, where it's not okay to, to put things down, to just be, and, and I think this relates too to that sort of these pockets of relationship that exist outside of that maximizing, you know, whatever it is, productivity. Because, yeah, you know, any real, I think, relationship that where there's, uh, where, it, where there's goodwill or there's love, it's not, yeah, it's not because someone deserves it or it's just, it's a free gift. And that's what makes it, that's what makes it touch our hearts. And yeah, and we, we can do that same thing with ourselves. So this is something he encourages and, and I, I like to tell people about it because I think it's, it's surprisingly hard to sit on you know, your couch or, or wherever in your house for five, even just five minutes and just notice all the impulses of everything that you think you should do and just say, well, not, not now, I'll do those later. Um, yeah, I think it can be really instructive. And, but yeah, but we can see it as a gift that we can give ourselves. So yeah, I think that's an important point in here, just in our, maybe in particular at this time and place, that giving doesn't always have to be kind of something extra that we put on top, like oh, on top of everything else, I have to be generous, but, but kind of, uh, yeah, in, in a way that maybe the most important gift we can give ourselves and others is sort of like an absence, the absence of expectation and pressure and needing ourselves or other, other people to be anything in particular and just kind of the generosity of presence, uh, of attention, you know, these very simple things. Yeah, and then there's the point of kind of what I was pointing to in the meditation about yeah, I think, you know, what we're tuning into here is is really joy, the joy of connection and of of showing up kind of for its own sake again, like not in order to meet some goal or something, but because the heart wants to be engaged and so this idea of showing up in a generous way to the moment and to our life. So, yeah, you know, not holding back. Um, and, and also, yeah, it can be hard to receive. So how, you know, not being in, you know, not being in denial or, or being kind of being closed off to the fact that like it or not, we are on the receiving end of a lot. So kind of it's in a way I feel like, yeah, this, this whole teaching is sort of helping us remember that we don't exist in isolation. We can't. And like it or not, we are in relationship. And so then it's just a, a matter of, you know, kind of what kind of relationships we want those to be. And, you know, like Ajahn Chichito makes, this way of relating is a really basic way, yeah, of tuning into a happy relationship one where there's giving and receiving. I mentioned this last time, and he mentions it in the book of this society. I don't know if he mentions where, where the most wealthy person is the person with the most debt because they're the person who has the most relationships. It's like your debt is so incalculable that you're just, yeah, you're just in relationship. There's no way around it. I think there's places in, in our lives too where, where we feel that, or, or I feel that. I mean, traditionally in Buddhism, they, they say that our debt to our parents is un, unpay, unpayable because they took care of us when, or whoever took care of us when we were helpless, you know. But yeah, it's these places where it doesn't, like, it, it doesn't compute. And I think in some ways we can resist that. I mean, living in this country, you know, we receive a lot and you know, we can feel, yeah, guilty, but that doesn't help, you know. So just kind of this 
recognition that, yeah, we are in, this, in these relationships of giving and receiving. Yeah, and it's, it's not all, it's, you know, it hasn't all been, you know, it's not fair, <laughs> but, but it's still, you know, it's still something that we can appreciate. And yeah, if we're, if we're more real about just kind of our position, however it is, then I think we're more likely to feel like we want to engage and feel like we want to participate in whatever way makes sense to, to share, you know? <laughs> If we recognize what we have, we're more we're more likely to to want to share, and you know facilitate that. So I think I'll leave my comments here. There's obviously a lot here to think about. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll just open it up. And and um, what I did last time was use my phone, and I think that worked. So with people in the room, if you want to talk, then I'll have you use my phone so people online can hear you. So give me one second here to set this up. Does anyone else have a phone that's working that might be able to... Yeah, mine... 